Um, so my name is Steve Leving. I'm a tech lead. <laughs> Sorry. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. The last session is now beginning. We do have one session here on the trade show floor. And there we go. Promotion. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. My name is Steve Leving. I'm a tech lead at Open Software. Um, also a certified Drupal developer. Uh, I've worked exclusively with Drupal for the last five years. Um, I'm also a certified Scrum Master, certified Scrum Product Owner, um, and typically I work with the uh, sales team uh, at Open uh, when we work on projects and bids uh, with people like the government of Bermuda. Uh, this is my fourth DrupalCon, but my first time presenting, so thank you. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. So like I said, I work at Open Software. We're located in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. Uh, we were founded in 2010. We currently have about 25 employees. Uh, and within uh, the 25 employees, we have two development teams. And my development team is the one that got uh, to work with the, the government of Bermuda. OK, can, uh, can everybody hear us OK? Uh, is that better? OK, right. Uh, good afternoon, my name is uh, Martin Walsh. I'm the acting director of the Department of E-Government in uh, Bermuda, uh, for the government of Bermuda. I've been working there for about eight years and I have about 30 years experience in systems. Um, now, just a quick question for you to uh, get this going. Um, hands up, who started in coding COBOL like me? Uh, not a lot of hands showing there, so <laughs> now that could be a problem, but that problem isn't for me, so let's try another one. Hands up, who has spent, and we'll take it the inverse this way, who has not spent at least 10 years using a waterfall type methodology? Not spent. Who's not spent at least 10 years doing waterfall type methodologies? One, two, three, four, five. Keep your hands, keep your hands right up, right up, right up. And out of those people, if you're not involved in, no, no, hands up, hands up, still. If you're not involved in sales in any way, put your hand down. Okay, so we've only got one person who's involved in sales potentially. Are you not involved in sales because you're in a big company or because you, in your purely back office coders type, uh, Technical people, or you're not you're not involved in small companies, because everyone involved in small companies in sales, really. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, uh, what, what what I'm trying to do in the session is I'll try and give you a few tips uh, of how to sell to people like me who've been around for a long time, and sell them something as new as open source and potentially as worrying to people who've come up in a traditional waterfall type environment where you do everything in slow steady stages uh, and a tip for you and the tip is drop the R when selling it to IT vets like myself now I'm not going to tell you what drop the R is it isn't drop it out of Drupal you don't say duple it's drop the R somewhere else but if you stay awake long enough in the presentation you'll find out as I get to it later uh, Bermuda just in case anyone didn't know where Bermuda was we're stuck there in the Atlantic. We're actually the second most remote populated island in the world. There's one in the Pacific, which is further away. We're 850 miles from the US coast, uh, Carolina. Uh, we've got a population of about 60,000 people. I work for the government, and the government employs about 12,000 of those people. And now, oh, Steve. Thanks, guys. So just for the agenda for this presentation, some run through some items that we're going to talk about. Um, so I'm going to get Martin back here in a second to talk about um, some intro and background to the project um, as we took it on. Um, then I'm going to talk about the response from open software. So as part of the proposal process, um, what we bid on, on the project uh, to Martin and his team. Um, then we're going to discuss the selection process, some of the planning and build processes, and then close off with kind of what's next in the project and some conclusions about lessons learned. Good. Okay. 
All right then, uh, why did we uh, look at replacing the portal that we had already? Um, there's a lot of things on that list which are probably common to uh, many other people. Uh, we had an old portal, we had out-of-date content, it wasn't very user-friendly, it had a poor search facility, uh, it was unreliable, uh, it lacked digital services of any sort really, uh, and it was costly uh, in the maintenance because it was Oracle. And that was one of the problems actually, is it wasn't Oracle when we bought it. We bought it as a Plumtree portal. Uh, and then BEA bought Plumtree. And then Oracle bought BEA. And so we had this old legacy system that Oracle didn't actually know anything about, which they weren't developing. They were just waiting for us to upgrade to one of their new Oracle products and charge us a lot more money, which we didn't want to do. Uh, and we found out actually when we were taking it down that it had never actually been configured properly uh, in the first place, which is one of the reasons it was unreliable. Um, so many departments, in fact, had gone ahead and left the portal and gone their own way, built their own websites. And really, this wasn't the platform we needed to launch digital services, because we wanted to launch digital services to reduce costs, increase efficiency, and improve service. Um, and this wasn't the platform to do it. So we had, when we started the project, we had three strategic customer-facing goals. Uh, the first was to become a trusted source of information. We wanted the portal to be trusted by people, um, to know the information was up to date and on what they wanted. We wanted it to be convenient. We wanted it to be available on mobile devices. The old portal certainly wasn't. We wanted it to engage the public and business. We wanted it to meet all the different uh, client, clients. Uh, we had four strategic operational goals. We wanted it to be self-maintaining. That doesn't mean we wanted it to have artificial intelligence and work out its own content and update itself, but we in the e-government department and the IT department didn't want to be the ones having to update it. We wanted it to be sophisticated enough to let all the users update it themselves but have controls in place and governance, etc. We wanted analytics, we wanted surveys, we wanted it to be measured, and we wanted it to be uh, to facilitate digital services, and that meant it had to be able to connect to back-end systems uh, to do that with interfaces, and our current portal couldn't do that. Thanks, Martin. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about Open's response and our bid process to the government of Bermuda. Uh, so looking back on the project and looking back throughout that process, I wanted to bring kind of three key points um, to share with you guys today. Um, and they might not be surprising um, for most uh, of the process uh, for the proposal. Uh, first being we had to sell Drupal. Um, so we had to sell Drupal over things like SharePoint and Sitecore. Um, we had to sell us as open. We had to sell the team um, to the government. We also had to sell the fact that we weren't on the island. So we weren't from Bermuda. Um, we are from Canada, so that's something else that we needed to, to make sure that we, we brought out in the, in the proposal uh, process. So in terms of selling Drupal, uh, three key points um, that we had for that aspect, first being community and existing technology. So we actually helped sell uh, Drupal by selling you guys and selling this event and selling all the people out there and all the people in all the other sessions. Um, that contribute to Drupal and contribute to um, the contributed modules of Drupal. Um, and it actually went a long way uh, with the government to make sure that they knew that there was a community out there. It wasn't just one company, it wasn't just Microsoft or, or the next company um, with its employees. It was a community all over the world. Um, and odds are there's people in Bermuda um, or surrounding that also would be potentially part of that community. So it, it definitely went a long way. Uh, the next being government adoption, uh, the fact that Bermuda wouldn't be alone. Um, so making sure that throughout the process, the government of Bermuda can compare Drupal to things like their proprietary systems, to know that Drupal um, is in other governments and that Bermuda, if they adopted Drupal, wouldn't be alone. They're not going to be the lone wolf and the only government in the world to adopt Drupal. Um, there's many uh, around the world. So we know that... <laughs> We know that uh, White House um, adopted uh, Drupal. We also know that the Canadian government 
um, where I'm from in Ottawa, adopted uh, Drupal early on and has many departments running on Drupal. And then most recently we know that the government of Australia um, switched all of their uh, systems to Drupal as well. So we wanted to make sure that that was uh, a selling point and, and to the forefront. Uh, the third for selling Drupal, and probably no surprise, is the price, licensing fees, and recurring costs, or the lack thereof. Um, so the price is free, um, and there's no licensing fees. And besides uh, essentially professional services or hosting, there's not necessarily any recurring costs to it either. Like Martin was saying before about Oracle, every time they wanted to make a change, they needed to renegotiate a contract, and that meant a few more licensing fees, and that went so on and so on and so on. So to, to make sure that we were at the forefront in the proposal process, we wanted to make sure that it was well aware that open source truly has no costs um, in terms of price and licensing fees. So moving on to selling open, so selling us, uh, there's three main uh, items that we want to look at in the proposal as well. So that's experience, expertise, and the fact that we were looking for a partnership. So in terms of experience, um, with working with other governments, we wanted to make sure that the government of Bermuda knew about that experience. We've been working with the Canadian federal government um, and municipal governments in the area for years. Um, so obviously bidding on this project uh, and submitting a proposal, we wanted to make sure that our expertise was at the forefront, or sorry, our experience was at the forefront. That leads to, to expertise. So um, we wanted to make sure that Open was at the top of the list when it came to expertise. Open, all of our developers are certified. We actually have some operational team members that are certified. Um, we have all the way from site builder up to grandmaster when it comes to developers. Um, we also want to make sure that we promoted our standards and best practices. Um, so when they were looking for a vendor, whether it be proprietary or open source, we want to make sure to drive home that expertise. Uh, the last item for selling open that I want to discuss was partnership. So we wanted to make sure that the government of Bermuda did not look at us just as another vendor or uh, look at it as just a standard client-vendor relationship. We definitely wanted to be able to promote uh, a partnership and a true partnership, making sure that we were collaborative um, with the government, um, making sure that uh, they knew that we were there with them. So even though we had our team in Canada, they had their team in Bermuda, together essentially we were one project team. Um, we also know that uh, in terms of the partnership, we, it leads to the collaboration aspects and things like that. Um, and that leads to selling off-island. So having to sell the fact that we weren't in Bermuda, we weren't down the street, um, they couldn't see us all the time. So three items that we wanted to uh, come across for that was check-ins, approach, and travel. So check-ins in the sense of making sure that Bermuda knew that we were always a phone call away. Um, we didn't have to wait for milestone meetings. We didn't have to wait for stakeholder meetings. Um, we could pick up the phone and call each other at any time, have a video conference at any time, and make sure that we really drove that home. Um, so it can be a random Tuesday morning, or it could have been at the end of the week, um, just to make sure we always had those check-ins to make sure that even though that we weren't on the island, um, we can still uh, communicate effectively. Uh, and then our approach. So our approach being collaboration was one of the key items. Um, even though we were uh, in Canada um, and they were on island, we needed to make sure that we were collaborative. And we took that approach right from the start, um, ensuring that they, they truly knew that. Uh, and then travel. So uh, making sure that right from the kickoff meetings, right from the initial sales process, obviously um, making the government aware that we were willing uh, to travel. Um, and obviously being in Canada in January, having to travel to the island um, in the frigid cold is not a bad thing. We didn't have to twist many people's arms. So, yeah. I'll pass it back to Martin. All right. Um, so the selection process, we have a quite a rigid RFP process at the government, like most governments do, and uh, we, we come up with a quite a comprehensive RFP 
uh, we actually got only 13 responses, which in a way was good because we were worried we might get 100 responses because a lot of people want to come to Bermuda to make a sales pitch even if they've got no chance of getting in the, the job. So, uh, And as a quick analysis of where they came from, six of the, uh, of the responses came from Bermuda themselves and all bar one involved, uh, it was just Bermuda, a Bermuda company front-ending a foreign partner. So it was really just... Uh, a, because part of our part of our selection process is, uh, ten percent has to go towards who's got the most involvement with the Bermudian company. So, um, three were from Canada, two were from the U.S., one from India, and one from the Bahamas. So, how did open source win the bid process? And this is really where I'm just going to go into a little bit of detail uh, of really the history of IT and, and really the history of my career in 30 years and how that's led to where we stand now with open source. Uh, you can see in that little diagram, it's a very, very much a uh, green, amber, red standard. Green's good, red's bad, amber's somewhere in the middle, uh, and bright green is the best. Uh, but if you look at the left-hand column, this is really the phases we've gone through in terms of uh, systems over the last 30 odd years. Uh, when I started in systems, everything was built. You built the system. You wanted a system, you built it yourself. Then it went into a big buy phase. There was lots of packages available, so you go out there and you buy a system. So it was a, the classic buy or build um, uh, decision. Uh, then in the last 10 years, you got a couple of other things came on. There was a subscribe with the internet and software as a service. You could subscribe to a service and you didn't have to buy anything. You just subscribed to the service you needed. And then open source as well came along. So open source meant that you could benefit from a number of things of other people building, help building the system for you. So just looking at the build to start with and going along the top, uh, the great thing about a build, obviously, is you own it. That's the bright green there. When you build something, you own it. You own it completely. And the functional flexibility is pretty good because it's all in your control. But if you have to build everything you want, the cost, it's going to be a lot, takes a lot of effort building everything from scratch. So the cost is high. I'm not telling you what RTW stands for. I want you to try and work that out. And there's another quiz for you. So there's two things you're thinking about now. So no falling asleep in the audience, please. Uh, so the speed to market is okay. It's in your control. But typically, if you build something from scratch, the speed to market is not going to be great. So that's an amber. And support staff and technical flexibility. You need more and more support staff. The more things you build and you have to support it all yourself, the more and more staff you need. Technical flexibility, if you start changing, building on different machines, different databases, different this, that's more and more staff. So it just gets more complicated. So that's another red. So what happened was that was how I was introduced to systems. I uh, was involved in building a system. We took it out to a bank in Egypt. We uh, uh, supported that system uh, I, uh, and then I moved on to uh, Bermuda. I moved to Bermuda from Britain and uh, I worked at the Bank of Bermuda and that was an NCR mainframe. It all had its own systems. Everything was built and while I was there they went through the revolution like many other com 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 companies and countries had done and decided I, we cannot afford, we haven't got enough staff, we can't keep up with the, the demand from the user community for the systems they want. So let's buy some instead. So we replaced all the NCR mainframes. We had deck packs, clusters, et cetera, and we bought package after package after package and had to interface them. And the great thing that gave us was the one green we got was speed to market. We could deliver much quicker than trying to build everything ourselves. So that was brilliant. Uh, and also, all the reds disappeared. The cost wasn't as much because all that money building, hiring all those people to build all the systems ourselves was better if we actually went the package route. Um, the support staff, we didn't need as many because you had the, the, the package came with vendor support, et cetera. Technical flexibility, you could actually flip and flop and have different technologies involved. But we also lost the greens because now we didn't own the software anymore. Now as a package, we weren't in control of it and we were at the, uh, we were at the sort of up to the vendor to decide, well, what direction they're moved in. We can try and influence them but perhaps we're one of many users. Perhaps most of the other users want to go in a different direction. So we really lose control. Uh, and obviously our functional flexibility goes with that. We've got flexibility, we can kick it out and get another package, but that's another major uh, exercise to do that. 
So this was part of the revolution that led to subscribe and open source. So where did that, <coughs> what did that give us? Well, I, I left the Bank of Bermuda. I joined Cable and Wireless in Bermuda. And uh, I actually left IT directly. I became head of, I was a, a VP at the Bank of Bermuda before in the uh, IT department. But now I became head of product development uh, at Cable and Wireless. They were trying to develop a new e-business. I caught the internet bug and I was really into that. Uh, this is in the, uh, in the 2000s. And uh, we were developing a, our own internet payment gateway. Our, our, the Cable and Wireless head office in London was, and that was to be used by all the Cable and Wireless offices. So we were then about four weeks ready to go live, and the dot-com bubble burst. And with the bursting of the bubble, the vendor that uh, Cable and Wireless London had employed to develop this system burst with it and went bust. So we were suddenly in a mad panic. Oh, my God. We meant to go live in four weeks. We haven't got a system now. What do we do? Should we go out and buy a package? Oh, my God, no, no. We haven't got time for that. So what we did was before the software as a service and service subscribe model became really popular, we actually started doing that by subscribing to a payment gateway from New York that was white labeled. We just white labeled it, stuck it out there with our name as though it was our system we just developed. No one knew the difference. It worked tremendously well. We were live in weeks, not in months, not in years, weeks. So the speed to market goes to bright green for the service. Uh, the support staff, we didn't need any support staff. It was a service. They did all that. Technical flexibility, fine. You want to go with a different technology, we just stopped subscribing to that service. We subscribed to a new service. So this was great. But ownership had now gone all the way from green down to amber down to red because we didn't own this at all. And it's really, it's basically like Google Mail. I don't like the way Google Mail works. I tell you what, I'll call them up and ask them to modify something. It's a service. They're not going to modify it. They couldn't care what you want. If you don't like it, you go somewhere else. So there's some functional flexibility. You've got the flexibility just to go somewhere else, but you've got no flexibility to change the product. The cost, I didn't give a green, and the only reason for that is because it looks great to start with, and you start subscribing to a service, but for the first year, the second year, that's terrific, but come the third, fourth, fifth, tenth year, you probably find you end up paying more money subscribing to the service than if you bought or developed the system yourself. So it's only an amber for the cost. Well, then I left Cable and Wireless. Uh, I ended up at government. And then when uh, I've been at government for a few years, I became the acting director of the Department of e-government, and we were faced with the replacing the portal. So open source, I certainly heard of open source, but I was, no, I was not a converted open source uh, like most of the people probably at this uh, uh, conference are. And uh, I looked into it, and obviously Open and others really sold me on and various things of it. And the more I looked at it, the more fantastic it was. Ownership, one of the biggest problems that had gone downhill in every stage, going from build to buy to subscribe, suddenly came back to bright green. I, we own this code. We own this product. They're terrific. Functional flexibility was suddenly now even better than when we built the stuff ourselves because... When we built the stuff ourselves in COBOL and whatever, we had, we used modules, we used calling modules, we reused code, we cut and pasted into things, but it was our code, and perhaps it was everybody else's code who worked in the same company. But now, through open source, I've suddenly got coders all around the world who are donating modules, and I've got a vendor who's got all this stuff. This is like, um, it's like COBOL on steroids. You know, suddenly everyone's contributing to it. Terrific. Uh, cost, low cost, no license costs, not nearly as bad as the packages, not even the high cost of subscription. Um, but in the speed to market, it's not as fast, necessarily any faster than buying a package. Uh, and it's probably the you know, same support staff and the same uh, technical feasibility. So we went in there. So where did that lead us? Well, I go back to the, if you remember, there was 13 people who bid for this. And this way, I've sliced them and diced them a bit differently. Uh, we, had what, we had all four of those layers. We had build. One person said, or one company said, they build it for us. So we had one of those. We had six buys, the uh, three in the middle there, SharePoint, three SharePoint, two WebSphere, one Sitecore. They said, it's a great package. It answers all your needs. Buy this office. 
We had one which was actually hosting only, which is a subscription service. They said, get your package from somewhere else, but host it with us. Uh, and we actually had a hosting aspect, which was as a service from several of the others uh, in there. Uh, and we finally had four open source solutions, which uh, came in. So we had all three layers in there on my diagram. So, uh, sorry, all four layers. Uh, so what do we decide? Well, basically, we decided to follow the yellow brick road. Except in this case, it wasn't the yellow brick road. It was the bright green brick road. Uh, so we went with open for the uh, software, which was great. Green, 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 green. Good stuff. Uh, and we went with Acquia for the hosting in a, in a uh, software uh, host, platform as a service model. Uh, green, 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 green. That was great. So now it's testing to see if you've been awake and you've had your mind working, even though it's late in the evening. RTW. What did RTW stand for? Because that got a green for both. Any ideas? This has been the bane of my life for 30 years as a systems professional. In various situations, I've been forever reinventing the wheel. <laughs> and all those methodologies before meant that I was reinventing the wheel. Even when I meant from build to buy, at the Bank of Bermuda, we kept buying all these packages and suddenly, we, when we built everything, we had one central information file, one customer information file, one GL, one central set of codes. Now we bought these five, six different packages. They all came with a GL. They all came with a customer information file. They all came with their own codes. We had to interface them all. We had to, you know, we were reinventing the wheel all the time. Every time we changed something, suddenly we don't need to reinvent the wheel because perhaps no one in the world needs to reinvent the wheel. Somebody somewhere in the world can write the best system or the best modules in Drupal for this, and then they can all be processed into the same. You, you can get hold of them through a community of interest. Um, so the other, if you remember back at the beginning, I asked you one more question. Drop the R. Can anyone see where I dropped the R? That man gets the prize. Free trip to Bermuda. Uh, just kidding. <laughs> Uh, that's right. It, if you're selling this to somebody in my sort of age group who's spent the last 30 years of their life working their way through all these problems, trying to not reinvent the wheel, trying to get over something, the last thing they want is somebody to come in and say, guess what, I've got a 25-year-old outside who's got the answer to all your problems and all the things that bugged you for the last 30 years, uh, and it'll only cost you 100000 Shall we sign up? And you're going to say, no, I've heard it all before. You know, I've had so many enterprise packages tell me all that I ever need is buy their one package and it does everything for me. You don't hear that. So selling it as a revolution is not the way to do it. If it's somebody from my era who's uh, used to structured waterfall technologies moving slowly, if it's a government, if it's a bank, just sell it as an evolution because this is an evolution. As I said, this is the same as COBOL was, except it's on a global scale on steroids. So, why did Open and Acquia win? Uh, as mentioned already, many government clients. I was really impressed by the fact that Open had so many government clients in Canada, Prime Minister's Office, the Canadian Transport Agency. There was an extensive modules and community. There was an extensive library out there. Um, the uh, community of interest for Canada was very strong. We also potentially can get the community of interest from Australia. That's what I'm trying to work my way into at the moment. Through Gartner, through Acquia, we got the contacts there because Acquia is the same hosting company. Uh, the impressive staff and the partnerships. I was very impressed with Open because there were other contestors. There was four people that bid with Drupal. They were the right size. They were young. They were lean. They were hungry. And they were the right size to fit with what we needed. And they had the inclination for a partnership. And I wanted a partnership. I didn't want a, a client-vendor uh, relationship. I didn't want some Swiss salesman to come in from IBM, as they did, and give me a 10-minute sales speech, expect me to sign away some millions of dollars, and then I'd never see him again. And we just one little dot. We're not important to them. I wanted a small company where we were as important to them as we, as, as uh, they, we're important to them as they were to us. 
Okay, uh, it was also low cost and within budget. That's fine, that's very good. It didn't win everything though. For instance, it didn't win the out of the box analytics. Sitecore came in, they, they were the best presentation. Sitecore blew us away, fantastic presentation, really impressive product and all the rest of it. But, you know, we have to, you have to make an overall choice in this. Uh, and Acquia themselves actually came later because Acquia had already been bid by one of the other Drupal companies. But we, we looked at Acquia and we thought, fantastic, really like the company, really like the security aspects, really liked uh, what they got. But they were only in the US. We're in an offshore, offshore jurisdiction in Bermuda. The government of Bermuda doesn't really want its business sitting in the US. So we discounted it for that reason. While the uh, selection process was going on, Acquia launched their global product, uh, which made it available. Open came and told us that they were, Acquia was their partner and said, why, not you, why don't you go with Acquia? It took us about 30 seconds to say, good idea, we'll go with Acquia. And that was, that was great because now, they were, now we host in the European cloud for Acquia. Okay, some quick figures. This came in, uh, from talking with consultants, we had consultants help us with the RFP, et cetera, uh, and we, we were expecting a $1.9 million project over multi-years to build the digital services, starting with a new portal. And we actually had the cost of, the anticipated cost of the portal of about a million dollars. What did we spend, well, what did I have as a budget when it came down to it for that year? I was told everything got cut, 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 I only had $500,000 as a budget for it. So that made things pretty difficult. What did we get as the offers? Who were the final two that came down to open one out of the Drupal bids and the other bid that was really impressive was the site core that came through a local company and a uh, US uh, building uh, company. Uh, on cost, there was absolutely no competition the site core offer over five years cost three times what the open uh, solution was on Drupal. In fact, the open solution on Drupal came in at half the cost that we were currently paying in support, et cetera, to Oracle. So yes, it was a no-brainer from a, from a price point of view, but that is not the way to sell it necessarily to the internal people in the organization who are uh, experienced, stayed, used to structured, careful methodology, the way to sell it is sell them first on the functionality and all the benefits it brings you. And then, if you show them this afterwards, this is like the icing on the cake, and it's like, well, oh yeah, buy it. Because you've already established that this is a good, as good ad, or as good as, or nearly as good as a product as you could possibly get elsewhere. And now over to Steve. Thanks, Martin. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the planning and the build itself. Uh, so yay, open one, but now what do we do? Um, so we went through this process, um, like Martin said, we won uh, the bid um, and we have to get started. Um, so in doing so, uh, touching on a few things, um, and we started with some project management methodologies to start with, so based on the, the bid and the proposal that we talked about earlier, um, collaboration and approach were um, some major things that we were considering and part of the reason why uh, we won and we were able to work on the project. Uh, so right away we looked at collaboration, we looked at timelines, we looked at budgets, um, and that all pointed us to Agile and, and Scrum more specifically um, to make sure we had that iterative approach um, to development, making sure that we can meet some of those timelines or, or all of the timelines, um, stay on budget, but also include the Bermuda team and, and make sure that um, since we had short uh, sprints, they were included essentially at every part uh, of the project moving forward. Moving along with just those methodologies is prioritization. So we also looked at the, some prioritization techniques along with this. Um, since, like Martin said, we had that limited budget now, we also had a, a tight timeline, we had to look at uh, prioritizing what actually needed to get done. So through discovery sessions, um, through a lot of conversation, through some architecture uh, of Drupal, we came up with a list of functionality and essentially listed them in uh, priority order, so making sure that at the end of the day, we were launching on April 1st no matter what. Um, so 
if we got close to that deadline and we weren't done everything, at least we knew the things at the bottom of that list we can go live with. They weren't deal breakers. Uh, all the deal breakers, all the must-haves were at the top of the list. Um, and again, it brought it back to the approach of collaboration and things to ensure that um, the Bermuda team was part of that process and part of deciding what the prioritization was. So knowing it's not a technical presentation, I still wanted to go through a few things of how we uh, won the bid uh, and what we decided to do afterwards. So Drupal obviously was the choice as we decided um, or discussed. Um, but we actually went with Drupal 7 and its contributed modules rather than Drupal 8. So when we started the project, Drupal 8 had just been released. Um, and we know when it just got released, there wasn't a whole lot of contributed modules. And in order to meet the budgets and to meet the timelines, we need to make sure that there was very little custom code or custom implementations as we moved it forward. So we made the decision to stick with Drupal 7 at the time, even though Drupal 8 was released. Um, to help aid in that though, when we were architecting the system, we actually broke some of the portal up in pieces and used things like multi-site um, to make sure that we can segment aspects of the portal. Meaning that when the time came to uh, upgrade to Drupal 8, we don't have to upgrade the whole entire thing at once. We can actually segment the upgrade path as well and choose various items. So even though we picked Drupal 7, we still had a plan for Drupal 8 going forward. Again, not wanting to get into too, many, too much detail uh, on some of the technical, but knowing that we didn't want to produce tons of custom code or custom implementations, um, and working with the Bermuda team um, and checking off as many boxes as we can for the build itself, obviously we had to pick a, a series of modules and, and items to move forward with. Um, so some key security ones, obviously security was a big aspect of it. Some key security modules that were chosen were security kit, uh, secure pages, password policy, honeypot, all things that are available from the community that was so important um, to Bermuda to allow us to implement uh, in the project. Same with some UX uh, modules or themes, making sure that we implemented navbar, style guide, and minimal. Again, um, third party contributed modules that allowed us to build out this system easily. Some assets, so as you can imagine with government, there's a lot of pages, there's a lot of links, there's a lot of documents, there's a lot of PDFs, um, making sure that we were able to still achieve that with uh, minimal effort, um, making sure that we were able to uh, install modules such as media and link it to achieve some of those things, to make sure that we can uh, implement all the links, all the PDFs that they wanted um, with out of the box solutions. Solar being the next one. Um, so the search in the old por portal um, didn't work very well. And we knew that search was a big aspect going forward with the new portal. Um, so Apache Solar was the obvious choice. Um, it has its integrations with Drupal already. Um, and it's been proven. Um, so we went ahead with, with Solar. And then last but not least for the technical items I wanted to discuss was just the Acquia Cloud Enterprise. So as Martin mentioned, it was pitched before. Um, it wasn't decided on until later on, but we did decide to go with Acquia in their UK data center. Um, there's a few reasons why Acquia was great. Um, and to bring it back to Bermuda, right out of the box it had its team management system so we can make sure that we had the open team and the Bermuda team accessing the same system. It has its workflows. We can create new environments that the Bermuda team can work on at the same time as the open team and vice versa. Um, so right out of the box it kind of hit the mark for all the, the approach and the collaboration that we wanted to achieve as well as the technical side of things. So I wanted to share this quote with you guys. Uh, so Open provided an excellent service and the Bermuda team is extremely proud of the end product. We have a world-class website, gov.bm, which came in on time and on budget. So I don't mean to share this as kind of a shameless plug for Open. Obviously we're very proud of the work that we did with Bermuda, but I want to share this specifically um, for Drupal in general. So I think we can also read this in terms of Drupal created a world-class website 
and the implementation of Drupal came in on time and under budget. Uh, so just wanted to make sure that we can tie that back to Drupal and when we're comparing it to some of the proprietary systems that Martin was talking about earlier um, that would pitch that we're world class and that you just need to install it so we're going to be on time. Our approach in using open source and Drupal can still achieve those exact same things. And back to Martin. Okay, uh, this is just the last section now. It's just looking forward and what's next. Basically, what we've got already is the portal. The portal is up there and it's working uh, and it links to all our existing online services. So you can go into the portal and the, the customer doesn't know it, but when they start clicking on, you know, pay my tax bill, etc., that brings them into the tax system and so forth, uh, or the immigration system for the forms and so on. But gradually we'll start launching new services, but we have got a two-way communication channel because we've got feedback forms on every page uh, in the right-hand side. So uh, we can get feedback on anybody from anybody about everything on that page. We've also got communication capability by two-way communication. Offering that, we only offered that when we went live to departments that already had email process in place because we didn't want to just make every department have an email communication they never had before when they hadn't got the process in place to deal with it. Because there's nothing worse than launching a service that an email that no one looks at uh, because then you'll just, uh, you'll just get a bad reputation. Uh, and what's in progress? We've got standard, co standard cookie cutter pro uh, forms in place, e-forms using Drupal, uh, which are gradually going to replace all Acrobat forms, Wufu forms, all the other types of forms we've got on there at the moment. We've got uh, standard e-payment gateway we're going to go up with, and we've got on, uh, links to online bank bill payment services in, uh, in Bermuda. And we're also about to embark on a pilot with MuleSoft for the uh, enterprise, uh, enterprise service bus um, using RESTful APIs. That will let us link to all these legacy systems we've got, AS400 systems, we've got some Unix systems, we've got Windows systems. Um, we don't want to replace all those, but we want to be able to suck the data out and use it in our digital services. And then we want to be able to pass information back from the forms and feed those systems as well. So that's uh, part of our in intention. Uh, and we've got a standard reporting mechanism. Now we've got good analytics, we've got good surveys, we've got the feedback forms. We want to keep, our, keep on top of all that. So the conclusions, the very final stage. Um, how did we do against schedule? As you can see, just from the top, that's a very aggressive schedule that we were set. Uh, the target date for, and this was, we launched the RFP on schedule in July, uh, and we had a very, uh, very aggressive schedule to have a contract signed by October 2015, the hosting set up by December, the build complete in February, so they had five months from when the contract was signed to get the build in, then a month of user acceptance testing in March, and we had to go live on April the 1st. I'd already tried going back and saying, well, April the 1st, but you should have a bit later. April the 1st, right. So how did we do against those schedules? Well, we started great with the RFP, or went on schedule. We actually even made the choice on schedule. Um, but then when it came to getting that schedule in, getting that approval process through the stages within government of, uh, you know, the, the, the different sort of levels of management level and then uh, ministry level and then cabinet level and then everything else. It took to December 21st before we got the contract finalized and signed, which happened to be about two and a half months later than scheduled. So I trotted off back to my PS and said, well, this time it's actually your fault. It's all your people up at the top. It's your fault. So obviously we could now move the date from April the 1st because that's not possible anymore because, look, we're two months, two months behind this impressive schedule. Okay, yes, April the 1st. I understand. <laughs> so, so we didn't get any joy there at all. Uh, but in came Acquia in their white cape. So we didn't sign the contract till four days before Christmas. Um, Fine, you, you, you want your new, your new setup live by December 31st? Open and Acquia together, got that new setup for us in December 31st. So that was in 10 days, including Christmas, New Year, Boxing Day, all that, that was phenomenal to make that. So the next challenge was opens. Um, we said they could have five months to develop the system. 
Uh, I then went back to them and said, well, I know I said five, but I really meant two. Uh, and they delivered. February the 29th, uh, good, day, it was a, good job it was a leap year. That, that software arrived. <laughs> that software arrived. It then took us a couple of weeks to finish off all the individual testing and this and the other to accept it, but that left us two weeks, not the four weeks, or in fact, it ended up as seven days, I think, of or seven or eight business days to do the user acceptance test, which is not the depth we really wanted to do it in, but April the 1st, it went live. So it was on schedule and it was on budget. Because I know we only said we had a 500,000 budget, but I managed to supplement that budget by canceling the Oracle support contract early, which cost us 230,000 a year, and finding a much cheaper way of supporting what we already had, just in case it fell over before we managed to replace it. And that was one of the original uh, plum tree uh, staff that implemented it for us. So that was great. And they were charging a little bit less than 230,000 for doing nothing, which is what basically Oracle did. Um, so we got there. Six, that, that together added up to about 700,000. We got there in 660,000. And we only had an 86,000 ongoing annual cost, but of course, a lot of costs to come with the digital service development. And sorry, uh, I meant to point out on that last one, the, the split, if you like, was, you know, a quarter of the budget went on the RFP, the, the requirements, the RFP, the design, which we involved some other consultants on. And uh, Partho did that, with, they, they were the company that did that, we we're very happy with them. And they introduced us to another partner, Forward View, who were also exceptionally good. And they really helped us, not only in that uh, initial stage, because they're another Canadian company, but they, uh, in the portal content, they really helped us in rewriting that content, because that was a, a huge task to rewrite that content, and they really helped us with that. So what happened in terms of satisfaction, though? So did we meet our objectives? Well, we actually had some very good figures in terms of the volume, the percentage of the population that used the portal, going back to right when I first joined the government in 2008, uh, and what the satisfaction was. And back in 2008, when the old portal had only been live probably a year or two, um, only 30%, which is very disappointing, of the population used it in our random surveys. But 73% of those people who used it were satisfied with it. Uh, which was great. Uh, so we went, uh, we had surveys like every uh, three months, six months or whatever, but uh, skipping forward to make a long story short to July 2011, we had doubled nearly the uh, usage to 53% of the population, but at the same time we'd halved the satisfaction because that had gone down to 34%. And then you skip, we had more surveys, but you skip another five years, and the very last survey with the old portal in March 2016 showed that nothing had really changed in the previous five years, and that we're now 54%, not 53%, which is not significant, and 37% satisfaction, not 34%, which is not significant either, just we plus or minus 5%. But when we launched the new portal, it had been in for two months, and I took a survey again, and the results were somewhat disappointing. But basically, the old adage of you have to pay the piper somewhere on the line came true because, um, you know, we can't cut all those corners and rush and keep it in to go live in April without rushing some things. And some of the things we've rushed was the, the way we launched it and the way we involved. We'd involved all the users a lot in focus groups, in designing the new portal, this and the other. And then we went such a sprint to get it launched we hardly involved them at all in the launch. We didn't invite them back to give the, to let us tweak the new content or this, that, and the other. And we had to make decisions to, to change things a little bit to get live. So one day, they didn't like the old portal, but they were used to it. They used it every day or whatever, and it was always the same. Next day, it was different. It was a different design, different. They didn't like it. So we had to overcome that. But luckily, we did overcome it because in only three months, I managed to turn that around not as much as I wanted to, but, and we still, this is a match in progress for the satisfaction, but we've already got the usage up to a very impressive 66%. So that's two thirds of all the adult population use the portal, not in the last three months like the original figures were, but in the last two months. So that is, we were very happy with that. So we have now the platform 
uh, that for digital services we want to launch, and we're starting to launch now. And the satisfaction hasn't gone up hugely yet, but it's gone up to higher than it was before, and that 41, we're going to push up to, to that's up to the 60, 70, even the 80 mark would be our target. All right, uh, so what were the lessons learned? Resources, budget, and time. Open source, cloud, agile, motivated project team. Get those four things together in the next major project you run, and you're well set to come in on time, come in on budget, and come in with uh, a limited resources, uh, as I'm sure you probably have. Everyone has limited resources. Uh, treat your vendor like a partner, and hopefully they'll treat you like a partner. Uh, look at the, Don't just look at the cost. Don't go for the lowest, because open weren't the lowest. The lowest bid we had was actually the life ray bid from the Indian company, but they didn't even make the short list. You know, so because there's other things you need to look at. So look at the vendor's record. Uh, what have they done with other people? But at the same time, look at the people they've got now, because they may have a fantastic record, but all the people who built that record may have now left. You've got to look at the people you're working with. Make sure you get the A-team. We got the A-team with the implementation, and we're really happy with, with Open and, and what they did for us. Um, look at the size of company as well. I didn't want to go with a huge company. I didn't want to go with an IBM and this and the other. So we're just another dot somewhere, a million. We're a blip in their profits. I wanted to go with a small company where we meant as much to them as they meant as much to us. I mentioned that earlier. So leverage and someone you can leverage their partners because we did leverage their partners. It wasn't just Open that helped us on this. It was Acquia. And now we're using MuleSoft, another partner of Open. So use that. The one where we failed, really, and to some degree, was keep the momentum going. One of the difficulties we had was coming in under budget, effectively, or certainly under what we expected, and on time and all the rest of it, is, well, that's done and dusted. Let's move our focus onto something else now. But it's not really done and dusted. It's the portals live, but we've still got years of digital services. And I've got an ongoing struggle, like most people in government, of getting the budget, getting the focus, getting the priority, getting the staff. Uh, to move as fast as I'd like to have on the digital services. But you, know, uh, you keep it going as far as you can. And the other tip there at the bottom is build for the future. Now, we found that out from the survey results pretty uh, convincingly. Uh, if you look, if you remember back to the slide said, what was my objectives when we went in? We had a lot of problems to fix. But you don't get a lot of thanks for fixing those problems. So don't underestimate the work it is to raise public satisfaction. And that leads into the next size, that one size doesn't fit all. Even though we think we've got a really modern design and we're, we're great, the, the, the age group that we've put off somewhat was our biggest user group before, which is the 45 to 55-year-olds. They were our, the biggest users of the old portal, and they are the least satisfied with the new ones. But we've really reached the young people because we're on mobile devices and we're et cetera, et cetera. So our usage of the 18 to 30-year-olds has rocketed up, which is great. Um, and the final lesson there was how you sell the solution. So it's really horses for courses. Remember, at some stage up in the, uh, pre in the authorization process, there's going to be people like me, people who are, who've grown up with used to waterfall methodology, slow, stay, particularly in governments, financial companies and all the rest. And if you're selling, if you're the salesman selling to those people, You've got to validate their life before and show them it's evolution. It's not a revolution. No one wants to hear it's a revolution. No one wants to hear that I've just wasted 20 years of my life doing it this way, and you can solve all the problems with one little system because I've heard it all before, <laughs> and it doesn't solve all the problems. So if you can show it's evolution and at the end of it you can show it's great value for money, then that's a win-win all around. The stress it's low risk and... Uh, that will clinch the deal. It's the, it's the established, it's a low risk, it's a logical thing to do, but, and it's cheaper, and it's half the cost of the others, that'll win it. Finally, I'm just gonna leave you with the portal, as I haven't shown you any of it before. This is what it'll look like on a handheld device. This is what it'll look on a, a tablet. Straight away, the old portal didn't look like anything on either of those. And this is what it looks like on the desktop. And there's the web address, www.gov.bm. 
please go on, please have a look, and please give us feedback. If you see that little uh, on the, uh, you can hardly see it, but on the left-hand side, there's a little feedback tab. You can give us feedback on any page. You can tell us how you think it should be improved, how if you've got a company, how you could improve it, uh, what, what we could do to, to make it better, what you don't understand. Um, we love it. So just give us feedback. I'm going to pass it back to Steve. All right. Well, thanks, guys. So that's it for us. Um, please make sure that you uh, check out the website where the slides will be posted um, and the recording will be posted. Also, make sure you take a survey. Tell us how we did. Um, we appreciate it. Uh, sprints, so we're asked to make sure that we make everybody aware and remind them of the sprints on Friday. I don't know if there's any developers in the room, but um, nonetheless, very yeah, important. Ladies and gentlemen, five minutes till the trade show floor closes. Mm -hmm. Five minutes. Thank you. <laughs> I guess so. Um, something that we actually just released that open a couple days ago is a new module called Content Synchronization. So we just wanted to share it with you guys as well. Um, essentially it helps with um, synchronizing content from one environment to another. We face this problem all the time in every um, Drupal implementation. So we're kind of proud uh, to put this on Drupal.org. You can definitely go check it out. Um, it just got released. Um, so it's in beta. But we're definitely just looking for some feedback and, and things like that on it. Apparently we're out of time, but the, the details are here um, for myself on Drupal.org, Twitter. Um, please feel free to send me an email uh, if you want, and uh, Martin's email is there as well. Uh, we're happy to discuss anything in the slides or the project. We're here for a couple more days as well, so if you see us in the halls, please stop us, and we're happy to chat. Thanks, guys. Thanks.